Well, hello. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Um, I think the last one was in front of a U3A group in 2017. So bear with me a minute. Uh, so I'm Toby Edson, I'm the area arranger at Mount Stewart. Um, Mount Stewart, fairly well known for its gardens, I suppose, but people don't necessarily know that it's a thousand acre domain that came into ownership of the wider uh, NC in 2014, 2015. I took on that management of the, the landscape there. So yeah, thousand acre domain, classic county uh, down drumlin landscape, post-glacial landscape, lots of packed glacial clays, hollows, sumps, and so on. Uh, it's about 60, 40 farmland woodland. And uh, there's basically lots of failed wood pasture. The woodland itself is in a condition of ores, so plantations on the ancient woodlands. <clears throat> and Roy was talking uh, earlier on quite a lot about this, this wood pasture having taken over a lot of these areas. And this is kind of what we're working on restoring at the moment. Um, so big elements of retention of deadwood moving forward. So definitely pay a few more visits and I'll hopefully get some, some uh, access for you. Uh, so we're moving into a regenerative farming model. Uh, so in 2014, we stopped all slurry application. Uh, bagged input into the land has gone down to less than 100 units per acre at the moment, and that's going to move to zero from next year. And we've basically been working on farmyard manure application only, minimum tillage, uh, mixed species swords, herbal lays, and lowering stocking densities right the way down, and also using the low stocking densities in winter to get them off of the farmland ground and actually do a little bit of wood pasture and woodland grazing to start to break up the ground structures and the rank swards that exist within the wooden glades. And <clears throat> with all of this, of course, is a lot of priority species recovery. My time has been in the early years focused on a lot of the mammalian stuff. So the red squirrels and pine martins are obviously a big part of Mount Stewart, as well as birds with, involved with Ulster Wildlife with the Barn Owl projects and so on. But the ancient woodland sites within the estates are probably about maybe less than 1% you know, existing of the remaining woodland. And that's the journey we're just about to start moving forward on. We've recruited two foresters that are going to help us transform this woodland back into mixed broadleaf and get all the right flora and fauna that come with it. Obviously, that had to start somewhere. Um, when I started, I mapped all of the plant-based invasives on the estate. And as you'd imagine, there'd be quite a lot for a, a horticultural heaven a post, uh, post pheasant managed estate. Uh, so there was a hell of a lot of red dendron ponticum, Japanese knotweed, snowberry, you know, we had it. And over the last seven years, we've cleared seven, uh, so it's 12 hectares of uh, invasives, and they are kept clear. Um, and we have very, very little regeneration at the moment. So one of the pros that we've been able to do this is because we've got a permanent team there. Um, so we're not restricted by grants, fixed term fundings and so on. So this is a permanent long-term project we're working on on the estate to get our land into a better condition. So that woodland regeneration is going to take the longer uh, arm of that. So we've worked on all of those key things first. So. One thing I noticed, obviously, as we were surveying and recording on the estate to understand the condition it was in, it was severely lacking in aquatic habitats. And it's a classic example of a lot of the land base post 1950s land improvement, drainage, so on. And this countless county down drumlin landscape should be absolutely covered in little small stranding water tables, small bogs, and so on. And it is a very, very dry landscape. So <clears throat> this brings me on to the topic, which is ghost ponds. What the hell is a ghost pond? Well, it's basically a remnant of a standard water habitat that existed in the landscape. Um, now, this could be a scrape, a pool, a small bog, a sump, um, a burial pool. All these, all these sorts of habitats are ghost ponds, effectively. And I've got to give full credit here to the University of Leicester and the Norfolk Ponds Project, which inspired me to do all of this work here at Mount Stewart. Is uh, they have got this a fantastic study. I should recommend you go have a look at it. Um, the key thing about these pools is that I say a lot of them are human uh, made, man made, um, or have been adapted from these uh, natural sites. But like I say, they've been typically filled in through like agricultural improvements uh, over the years or through light uh, vegetative succession. 
Uh, now, the easiest way to find these is look to the old maps, and we have a fantastic resource with the brand new map here in Northern Ireland that has all of the maps going right the way back to the early 1700s. So this is where I got most of my uh, resource from to find these sites. But it doesn't always need to have a map. Sometimes you can see these, uh, they turn up in events of high rainfall. You've always got perhaps a small marshy patch within a given field. It's a perfect example here. This is the temple field in the south of the estate. It's actually part of a network of brackish swamps that would have uh, existed in this area when the uh, sea level was a bit higher. And then how you look at that course, it was actually the land level was lower with the glacial weight and ice rebound and all that sort of thing. Anyway, so one of the really important things about these ghost pond sites is they have all of the aquatic plant seed bank within them. And this has been the basically the kickstarting uh, motion of restoring these pond sites into functioning aquatic habitats. So <clears throat> like I say, once was, what's once was, um, this was the 18, yeah, the 1832-1846 OS map. You can see quite a number of ponds marked across this site. Um, and these are just the ones that are marked. I know there are a lot more uh, within the landscape at this stage. Um, so at, at this point, we were looking at yeah, 11 marked ponds across the whole of the Mount Stewart estate. There were three named springs. There were a lot of other ones with small surrounded water tables. And yeah, over 30 kilometers of streams and ditches. Um, so even at this point, the land was already being drained. And yeah, by, by the mid 70s, if you look at the uh, OS maps from the 70s onwards, they are basically disappeared, uh, completely gone. And the central lake had been created though, however. So it doesn't really, unfortunately, replace all of these small pools and fun habitats around the estate, but you can see the difference there in terms of the amount of water habitat that remains, just a few small open ditches. A lot of these have been closed up and culverted and drained. So with the loss of all this across habitat, all of the invertebrates have gone with it. I am getting to the invertebrate bit as well in a minute. So <laughs> the first one we started with was um, Burby Scrape. Um, Think of this, what I'm talking about here is more about the learning and the practice of what we're doing here. Um, we've taken a lot of the information that we've learned, uh, a lot of the well-placed well information around um, freshwater habitats trust and their, their pond restorations or wetland creation guides, and we've basically applied them to Mount Stewart itself. Now, one of the first learnings was, um, take lots of pictures, I didn't, um, I had to raid my uh, Twitter feed for all of our threads around um, some of these early ones here. A lot of it was recorded in video because um, the first one that we did was during lockdown. So we did a lot of interpretation with our, while well, everybody else was locked down, I was still out on the estate doing our work. Um, and yeah, so take lots of pictures. Um, do it in summer rather than winter because it's usually a lot easier to actually move soil around when it's not really wet and slushy. However, this first particular site, Burby Scrape, because it was done in autumn and into winter, I was effectively excavating the site blind. And as a result, um, it's created a really interesting kind of mini atoll effect uh, with all of this fantastic muds as the water drains down in summer, um, which has provided absolutely incredible habitat for lots of the uh, invertebrates that rely on those muds uh, for, for their uh, larval stage. Uh, and of course, it's then now really well established. Uh, this, again, it's one of those ones where you have to also look closer at this, like everything. The amount of aquatic plants that have started coming up, uh, we have done no transplanting, no seeding, we've just done these sites, and basically, if you build it, they'll come. And it very much is that case. Some of you will get a reference on me. So, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> in the first summer alone, um, we've started finding all sorts of uh, mollusks um, and various other larvae coming through. That's why I was asking Helen about the standing water habitats, um, because we're finding so many different species covered by well over my head. I've got only so much headspace when this particular element of my work is, is a tiny, tiny bit. So I cover a whole estate, all its farmland, all its woodland, all the visitor side of things and so on. So, so there'll be an invitation uh, coming up later on. And 
So yeah, eight species of dragons and damsels recorded uh, breeding at that site in the first year, seeing um, Aglaean behavior, including migrants, uh, hawker as well. Uh, so all the flying stuff basically started arriving very quickly, as you'd imagine. So many uh, aquatic diving beetles are turning up. And again, haven't been able to actually survey what is there yet. And we're just starting to establish a bit of a working relationship with um, Green's biological department to start some baseline surveys of not just the ones we've already created, but the ones we're going to. So we're going to hopefully get a year on year progressive species data of what's coming to these pools and then what comes out of them as well. So there's definitely been a case where some things have been hanging on uh, on Mount Stewart Estate, just in sort of, we're talking very, very low populations that were just on the cusp of being destroyed, but we've obviously been able to move in at the right time and start this habitat recovery process. And as a result, these populations have exploded. So to get all of these predators that are turning up, um, and including the smooth nuke turning up as well, there definitely has to be food there. And I mean, there are absolute mush bits of, of uh, flies going on, as you imagine. So it's definitely working. Um, but what I'm really wanting to know is, well, what is actually there? And like I said, once we started, we can stop. So we've done four more sites uh, since uh, Bobby Scrape, which was done in, in the winter of, of, winter of 2020. Uh, so laundry pool, um, learnings from this one is that uh, don't rely on utility maps being the correct depth or accurate locations. So this is a part of a, an old canaled stream uh, that was reopened into the stranded water table it was. It happens to be a mains water pipe running down there. I hit it, uh, which made a really interesting moving water feature, but obviously it wasn't particularly great for the tenants on the estate. Um, but this is one of the big learnings from doing this process is having to be quite adaptive in what we're doing because a lot of these pools were also filled in with lots of things, including asbestos that was just been dumped from the estate into these. They just filled it in with whatever they had at the time. So we've had to be quite adaptive in moving the sites as close as possible to the original sites as we can. One of the challenges has also been around managing our curatorial input. It's a historic park member state. So some of our historic curators are getting a bit itchy about changing the designed landscape. But like I say, we played them at their own game there and showed them actually it was here on the maps in next year. So South Moor Scrape was one that we did uh, just uh, last year. And that actually doubled up into a second one just nearby, which was an old dipping pool associated with the tree nursery in the orchard that used to be on the estate. Unintentionally turned out to be a comical Dinosaur footprint, um, but <laughs> it is what it is. Um, yeah, talking point, I guess. Um, so there's a few things that we've been doing to enhance um, the rate of recovery of these sites. Like I said, we haven't necessarily planted or introduced species or anything like that. It's more about getting the framework right for them. So deadwood transplants have been uh, quite important to just increase the complexity of the habitats there. Um, all taken from the estate itself. So we're not bringing anything else in that already exists on the estate. Um, Roy highlighted something earlier on that was really quite important is, is the tree safety management and health safety issues around retention of standing deadwood is, is a real, real problem, um, like right across the board. And our attitude towards that is like we have a legal obligation in certain places, but in, in most cases where we can, we'll move the target that the tree is the risk to. So if we've got a path passing under a tree that has some fantastic veteran features and deadwood forming on it, we'll move the path because for us, that's the more important thing. Um, so these deadwood transplants, they're, they're basically from sites where we have to move the wood from, say it's right next to a, a building or something like that. So, and we'll move it over to these sites. Uh, and like I say, the, the, ha the habitat recovery is, is just been sped up so much faster just by creating this little bit of complexity within the landscape. And the seed bank is again, the most important thing. And I would highly recommend if you're looking at anything like this on your own land or working as part of a project, do refer to the Norfolk Ponds project and their guidance around identifying where the seed bank is within the substrate as you're excavating. Um, so there's quite a few challenges, as you'd imagine, with doing projects like this. Um, resources is always going to be the one. You know, time is money, money is time. Um, 
We're obviously quite lucky, as I said, that we have a permanent resource within Mount Stewart in terms of retaining skills and also the equipment that we have. So, you know, we have our own excavator on site, which has been doubling up doing the work with the trails and access uh, work that we do at Mount Stewart itself. Um, skills and knowledge, like say, having a retained permanent members of staff within the ranger team basically retains that knowledge and that local knowledge that becomes specialist at the site. Um, using contractors is fantastic. Uh, you know, it can be very easy if you don't necessarily have those things available, but having the knowledge and resource of the site that's more than just a uh, passing survey is really, really vital where you can have all of these little nuisances dealt with quite quickly. Um, now, access is a challenge in its own right, not just for us to get to site, but also people and our lovely friends' dogs. Um, it's not the dog's fault, it's, it's dog owners, let's face it. Um, there, are, there are some questionable dog ownership practices out there. Um, it's one of our biggest challenges, actually, where we're trying to balance access and conservation with our work. You know, we, we need people to see and experience these sites them to value it and um, and quite often a lot of them have doggos and of course there's a whole associated issue that was highlighted in recent studies there the links are at the bottom there around the shape of flea treatments into waters so it's shown up to 80 percent of invertebrate life is is killed through leachate building up within standing water habitats and so this is the, one of the last things i want to happen to these sites as i'm restoring them and um, because they're arguably pristine at this stage. So um, Burby Scrape, for example, we're just taking the approach at the moment. I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and not have to fence this off. So we've created a, a, a dead hedge buffer between where the trail passes by it. So you would literally have to climb through it and break through it to get up to it. Obviously, we have a dogs on lead policy at Mount Stewart, so everybody should have their dogs on lead. Not everybody applies. So I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt here that Hopefully they will work with us on this, along with some interpretation, just to just for them to start thinking about why we have uh, the things we do. Um, just drawing a little attention, because you know what people like, it's a busy world out there. So it, it's been a challenge um, working through this. I'm hoping that the benefits of people being able to see these sites um, will inspire, hopefully, new entomologists coming through. Um, and I'd like to close basically with an invitation to the audience here. If you want to get in touch with me um, and come and survey some of these sites, not just the uh, ghost pond sites themselves, but anywhere on Mount Stewart, it's a thousand acre estate which hasn't had any public access to it beyond gardens for hundreds of years. Um, I'd very much like to facilitate access to people who are looking at doing studies, doing small species groups, focuses, like I said, this is why I was asking about the, the caddis and um, uh, stoneflies uh, to Helen there. So um, please do get in contact. And if you want to follow the journey of, of what uh, the Ranger team are doing across Mount Stewart, there's all the socials. And uh, I'll happily bend an ear that's willing. So thank you. It's yeah, it's the School for Biological Sciences. I can't remember everyone's name because it's part of the student space biological club as well. Um, but if I email you the details, we'll start talking and hopefully we can um, get some good things going. Yeah, sorry. So yes, um, it's the School for Biological Sciences in Queens uh, that we'll be uh, working with. Uh, but let's say, contact me if you've got any uh, queries around that, and we can uh, look forward to it. So this is where Mount Street is really lacking in data much beyond when the National Trust first took ownership of parts of the estate. So there was a full biological survey done in the, in the mid-70s, and then I think there was another one done in the, it was 1992, 
by the NT's biological survey teams, so that was Matthew Oates, Pete Brash, and so on. Um, there's very little data back beyond that, and certainly not of aquatic stuff. Yeah, so, so stuff that may be here, species that may be there and are, are recovering as a result of this work, have possibly not been recorded there before. I mean, I've certainly recorded quite a few things in, in other groups that certainly that haven't been recorded at the site before. But they're probably always there. It's like under recording is a big issue. Yeah. Yeah, I did the uh, as the balance of the and there was no Yeah. Yeah, they but I think from what I understand it just just didn't have a much and they only said it was in the three type cases. Yeah. Yeah, so it's semi brackish still, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it. So, so this is one of the things I noticed right at the start is just like, you know, water is life. But you know, if we're generalizing this, we needed to get that back in. And, and the sooner we started this, the better. And, and I'd say I'm blown away at the amount of species that are turning up. Like it's too much for me to cover, basically. That's, that's why the big invitation is there for people to come out and uh, just get more eyes on the place. Could be, yeah, so some, some were, some had also well sites. Um, there are also quite a few that were, like, from what I can see, were part of the dug dipping pools or, or cattle feeding pools and things like that, yeah. And um, the ones that were just plucked out on the map there in the, in the slideshow, that was just a few that were marked. We found obviously so, so many more. Um, the other thing that we're working on is the wet woodland habitat as well, um, with all of the drainage that took place with Forest Service uh, passing through drains in the 60s. And we're hoping to basically turn some of those back into wet woodland again. I might have a conversation with the country about the semi-saline habitats which have been badly damaged mm -hmm. on the foreshore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, it would be it would be the countryside manager that's who you need to speak to about that as part of the strength of the team. But I can certainly put you in contact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>